Good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's discussion on fighting the pink tanks and why menstruation is a luxury. I'm Pradeepa Kulasekaral. I'll be the moderator for today's session. This discussion is the last of a series of conversations that UN Women is co-hosting with the Embassy of France in Sri Lanka on a number of important topics related to gender equality and strengthening women's rights in Sri Lanka. These discussions are leading up to uh, the Generation Equality Forum in Paris that is scheduled from 30th June to 2nd July. The Generation Equality Forum is a global gathering consisted of governments, civil society, private sector, social influencers, and other stakeholders to make concrete, ambitious, and sustainable commitments towards achieving gender equality. The forum is convened by UN Women and co-hosted by the governments of Mexico and France. So before starting with um, today's discussion, I would like to remind you that simultaneous interpretation services are available in Sinhala, Tamil, and in sign language. Please follow the steps in the screen uh, to select those options. Also, we have a uh, chat open for your direct questions to the discussion. Depending on the availability of time, we will be taking them towards the end of the discussion. So uh, today's discussion will specifically focus on sexual and reproductive health rights and body the autonomy of the women in the Sri Lankan context and how this perception contributes to period poverty. We would be unpacking this conversation from a few angles. First, to understand what we refer to as body the autonomy and what, why body the autonomy is important to women. The issue of period poverty, why it exists, the stigma, the cultural norms, and the lack of uh, awareness around this topic. Then we will be looking at legal and policy barriers that make menstruation hygiene products and education accessible. We would be also looking at how COVID-19 has heightened the urgency of these issues and how women from marginalized groups may experience challenges differently. And finally, we will be also discussing the way forward and how we could contribute to address these issues. So to start with the discussion, let me now introduce the speakers. We have the honor of welcoming two personalities who have been highly engaged with pioneering advocacy around sexual and reproductive health rights in Sri Lanka, who have been continuously involved with public discussions on these subjects. Anuki Premachandra and Dr. Rashmira Balasuriya. Anuki Premachandra is a strategic communications manager at AdFactors PR Sri Lanka. Prior to joining AdFactors, she has been working in the development field, previously at a local think tank called Advocata Institute, and also at the World Bank. At Advocata, as their communications manager, Anuki spearheaded advocacy for public policy reforms, campaigning for the reduction of taxes on sanitary napkins. Thank you for joining with us today, Anuki. Thank um, you for having me. Next, we have Dr. Rashmira Balasuriya, who's a medical doctor, currently working and training in family medicine. She's also the head of mentors at ARCA Initiative, an organization aimed at providing tangible and practical support on issues pertaining to sexual and reproductive health. Welcome to the discussion, doctor. Thank you. So before uh, getting into a more focused discussion on period poverty in Sri Lanka, it would be helpful uh, to our audience if we unpack some of the terms that we will use in our discussion today. So my first question is to you, doctor. Uh, what is meant by body autonomy? And why do we say that body autonomy and uh, sexual reproductive health rights are important? And also, how do bodily autonomy and the access to and knowledge on SRHR affect women? Over to you, doctor. Thank you. Um, so yes, so when we talk about bodily autonomy, we are basically talking about um, giving a person, an individual, it's a basic right-based uh, 
pretty much giving an individual uh, the right to make an informed decision about themselves, their own body and their future without any external factors such as violence or coercion. So now this may seem pretty obvious to uh, kind of like you and me because we always make decisions about our bodies quite often. But when you think about marginalized communities, when you think about women in the rural areas, they don't always have this opportunity to make decisions for themselves, especially when it comes to certain topics in healthcare, like contraception use, childbirth, um, things like that. They almost always have someone else making the decision for them. And that's exactly why sexual and reproductive health rights kind of play into it. Because um, as you probably know, there is no island-wide sexual and, uh, sexual and he reproductive health education in this country. And therefore, a lot of women are unaware about their rights, unaware what they can make a choice on, and that they have the decision to decide on contraception for themselves uh, at the time, what's right for them. So they don't have this um, information. And obviously, without information, they don't have the knowledge to make an informed decision. Um, if you give them um, the sexual and reproductive health rights information, then they are more empowered to make a decision for themselves, the right decision for them. And this in turn will help them make a proper informed decision for their families, uh, pertaining to anything at all, and to an extent for their communities as well. And if you give them the autonomy to make these decisions, it helps communities um, progress and prosper. Thank you, Doctor. Um, so while continuing on the same topic on body the autonomy, I would like to know from the two speakers how body the autonomy in the context of Sri Lanka, in the, in the Sri Lankan culture, reflect is reflected in the places of power. Um, uh, I would like to start with Anuki. Uh, what are your thoughts on this, especially um, from the legal and the policy angle? Um. I think I really echo what Dr. Rashmira was just talking about uh, in, in terms of a lack of information and awareness. And that comes from a lack of education right at the very roots. And we see this reflected even in the policy space where decisions need to be you know, made when it comes to allowing women to have that autonomy over their bodies, understanding that certain women in marginalized communities don't have that, um, you know, um, don't have the, the, the autonomy to their body. So I, I think really we play on with the issue of education, awareness and information. Um, and I think that the efforts, I mean, there has been a huge change in the landscape over the past few years, I have to say. Um, and, you know, with generations to come with the use of digital media, I think there is a lot that is being discussed, but um, just um, not knowing that you have that you have the autonomy to your body, I think that, that, that is really where the problem is. Thank you, Anuki. Um, doctor, if you also want to contribute to the um, same question. Yes, so speaking from a medical uh, point of view, speaking of the medical community, I think it's no secret that there is largely a paternalistic relationship when it comes to the doctor and the patient. And there's a lot of, you know, whatever the doctor says, I'll do kind of situation in, the, in Sri Lanka. But I see that slowly changing. I see it more, it becoming more of a shared patient, doctor-patient relationship uh, when it comes to decision-making, especially about important topics like sexual and reproductive health. Um, however, still uh, in the medical community, there are some discrepancies, especially when we talk about hysterectomies, which is where the woman um, chooses to remove her womb, possibly for a medical reason, or even when it comes to methods of permanent contraception like tubal ligation. So it's not very well known, but um, even though a woman signs a consent form for this procedure, for her own body to go and undergo this procedure and for her to deal with the consequences, we can't carry out this procedure unless her husband signs the consent form. So now that is really shocking because that take that is what taking away one of the fundamental medical ethical principles, basically, of giving the pa of patients autonomy, giving a right, the right to a competent adult to make an informed decision about their own medical care. If you're waiting for the husband to sign a consent form, then you're taking a woman's bodily autonomy away from her. And that is just one part of, um, you know, where in the medical community, we see this problem. And then again, when it comes to abortion, I think as possibly, probably everyone knows, Sri Lanka is one of the toughest, strictest abortion laws. You know, we don't allow abortion unless the mother's life is at risk, even in the cases of incest or rape 
or if there's a lethal congenital anomaly where the fetus will die as soon as the fetus is born, we can't uh, conduct a safe abortion. And uh, this is all primarily like attributed to the cultural and religious views of the country, but it's, it takes away the woman's autonomy to make a decision about her body, especially in the case of abortion, because at the end of the day afterwards, she's the one who has to raise this child and no one looks to see whether the child is being raised with neglect, abuse, poverty. So there are a lot of consequences by not giving a woman her autonomy to make these decisions. Thank you. Yes, certainly. Um, yeah, there are like consequences that affect the society in a negative way by when the body autonomy of uh, women is not respected. Yes. Um, so next, uh, I would like to um, pose this question to Anuki. Um, what do we mean by period poverty? And how does period poverty affect the women in broader national and social progress? And also like, um, how pads and other female sanitary products marked as luxury? All right, so um, period poverty is, is really the inability to have access to menstrual hygiene products, um, usually because of the cost of the product. So it's the inability to, to be able to afford a menstrual hygiene product of choice. Um, is, is how I'd like to put it, because we're talking about bodily autonomy. I think it's very important that we understand that we're talking about an argument of choice here. Um, so period poverty is actually a big problem in Sri Lanka. We don't have general statistics to, to say that it's, this is the percentage of women using sanitary napkins or using menstrual hygiene products in Sri Lanka. But the research that is there, the, the surveys that are there show that period poverty, especially in the more poorer pockets of Sri Lanka, like Monaragala um, and, and in certain communities are, are definitely are definitely higher than it is uh, potentially in Colombo. And I think uh, the biggest problem with uh, period poverty is that it, it, it's not just a financial issue. Right. It's not only a matter of not being able to afford a sanitary napkin. It's, it's something far bigger than that. It's something that affects your menstrual health. Uh, and there is a risk there. It's something that studies have shown affects education. And that is a problem there. So period poverty is, is a grueling issue that has spillover effects on, on different parts of um, you know, society. So I think that is really something that we need to start thinking about and we need to really um, you know, start fighting for. Um, and then coming on to the next part of your question, which was about uh, menstrual hygiene products in Sri Lanka and then why they are a luxury. So uh, previously, like you said in my bio, while, while I was at the Advocati Institute, one of our biggest uh, projects were trying to spearhead a campaign to reduce the import tariffs on sanitary napkins. And this was because we came to realize um, how high the tax was. So when advocacy started, the tax was actually at 101.2%. And this is in a country where 52% of it is women. Um, so it started with the absurdity of the numbers. But the more research we did into it, we realized how this spilled over, like I said, into education, into health. Um, and um, you know, what a big issue this was. And it, there's been about two years of that. There was about two years of advocacy. The taxes have been taken down now to about 50%. But we, we still say it's a luxury because women, they don't have the choice. When you, when you look at a tampon, for example, you can't find a tampon in stores here. You can only find it at like a pharmacy somewhere fancy because they get someone to bring it down. Uh, a $1 tampon package sells for about 2000 here. How women don't have the choice, right? If the product is available in the country, you should, I, you know, you should be able to have that choice to use a sanitary napkin or to use a, a reusable sanitary pad or to use a menstrual hygiene cup. We have all of these alternatives to um, help women deal with their periods, help women deal uh, with their sexual health. But, you know, these products aren't available to us. And predominantly it's because of our tax, uh, the, the culture of taxation here and then the numbers. Thank you. Yes, um, like Anuki rightly pointed, um, period poverty definitely affects the menstrual hygiene. Um, so Dr. Rashmira, you have been engaged extensively in the grassroots 
uh, to break these uh, stigmas around menstrual health and hygiene. Um, so from your opinion, what is the social perception on menstruation? And um, what are the stigmas around menstruation? And uh, does this refer, uh, does this differ across urban and rural divides? Or is it generally common to all the broader Sri Lankan society? Yeah, so actually exactly what Anoki said, when you tax a sanitary product, you're taxing a basic biological process. You're making it seem as though this is not something natural, as if as if women and girls uh, have a choice in this matter, you know, to, to not bleed. You know, we don't have a choice like that. A lot of women don't have a choice and we have to bleed every month. So when you're taxing a basic biological process, even the even men in rural communities are wondering, well, this is not normal. You know, this, this shouldn't be accepted as a normal practice. So you're giving that kind of a stigma to it. You're limiting women from performing the from being productive and performing their daily activities. Like they can't go to work, they can't go to school, they can't take part in sports. You're really limiting them and you're also moving them towards choosing alternatives that are not healthy. Uh, for instance, they do use cloth here a lot in rural communities, but they don't, they're not taught how to use the cloth properly. So a lot of women actually are at risk of infection. They don't wash the cloth properly. They don't dry it properly. And these are real concerns. Um, additionally, when you're talking about stigmas, there are a lot of stigmas about menstruation purely because there is no sexual and reproductive health education. So these stigmas are coming down from generations and generations and getting added on. Things are getting added on, but nothing is getting clarified. So even teachers don't know how to teach their students the correct thing because they don't know what the correct thing is. Even mothers don't know what the correct thing is to tell their children. So I hear everything. The commonest is uh, menstrual blood is impure or dirty blood. And even in 2015, they conducted a study in um, the Kalutara district uh, asking teachers and students. And 60% of teachers said that menstrual blood is impure. 80% said you shouldn't bathe when you're on your period and even that you can't swim whilst you're on your period. So these are fundamentally wrong practices that you're teaching the younger generation. So these are very common um, stigmas and Mr. I here. And uh, in that same study, 66% of uh, the students were not aware about menstruation until they actually attained uh, menarche, until they had their first period. So that just goes to show how unprepared people are to deal with, how unprepared girls are to deal with menstruation. Um, to answer your other question about differences between urban and rural communities, yes, I see there is a bit of a difference uh, between urban and rural communities in the types of stigmas they have. But this is purely due to a lack of access to information or the availability of the internet. So in urban communities, you know, kids are all have internet. They all can Google quickly what they need, whether they get the right information or whether they get the wrong information is a different story. But there are some sort of information. So their questions are different to what you get from uh, girls in a rural community. So in a rural community, they ask us questions like, can we go out in public if you're on our period? Can we touch plants if you're on our period because I think something happened to the plant? Um, can we bathe? Bathing is a huge uh, thing that people think you can't bathe whilst you're on your period uh, for some reason. So that's a huge problem that we have to stop. And then in urban communities, you hear things like, will I get pregnant if I have sex on my period? If I swim, will uh, my period stop permanently? You know, the questions are different, but fundamentally, um, they all have a lot of stigmas and myths around menstruation because menstruation is such a taboo subject in this country and no one has proper sexual and reproductive health education. Thank you, doctor. Um, I would like to um, pick up from the place where Dr. Rashmira's talk. Um, so Anuki, um, do these uh, stigma on menstruation have an impact on women and girls beyond access to sanitary products? How does it impact their education, um, employment and relationships? Oh God, yes. Um, I think that's a that's a big problem, and you know, even even in terms of like their menstrual health, right? It's it's a big problem. For example, there's been multiple studies about this in, in South Asia about how it's been very tough to introduce um, reusable sanitary napkins because people don't wash it and put it out to dry, right? Because there's just you know, you don't want to put that out. Nobody needs to see it. Nobody needs to talk about it. And there's so that that culture that we've associated with it, I think, is why we're having all of these issues in the first place. I mean, even in the tax advocacy, I realized how 
um, you know, we did, I mean, sometimes we would have a lot of support in private, but then people wouldn't want to publicly, even certain policymakers wouldn't want to publicly come up and talk about it. I mean, even in, in I, I remember this like very distinctly, there was once a conversation um, you know, with, with, with some policymakers, they were trying to see if uh, this was around the time where they were trying to, um, where they were trying to give free sanitary napkins to school, uh, to, to uh, children under the age of six, girls under the age of six. And, you know, someone said to me, I didn't even know this was a problem. Like, this is not discussed at home. You know, my, he had a wife and daughter. So he said, they, you know, they never brought this up as a question. I didn't know affording sanitary napkins or, you know, menstrual hygiene products was, was a problem. And I think that's so the stigma and then years of um, taboo we've attached to it, I think, has, you know, has exacerbated these issues um, drastically. And uh, in terms of education, in terms of employment, for example, um, I've, I've noticed how, you know, in workplaces, um, Sometimes, you know, you're on your periods, you really want to take, you want to take a day off, you want to take a sick leave, but that's not really something that most workplaces have made acceptable. And, you know, it's not, it's not a culture that most workplaces have here. We see that transforming. Most workplaces are now quite progressive. You know, there's leave, uh, at least there's open conversations about these things. But I think the stigma and, and the taboo uh, that, you know, that, that's not a this up really plays out, be it at school, be it at work, um, be it at, you know, decision tables. Thank you. Dr. Ashmira, do you also have anything to contribute um, to the same um, topic that um, Anuki uh, discussed? Um, yeah, pretty much the same that Anuki said, but also from that study they, that I was mentioned earlier, they found that if a girl misses at least one to two days of school every month, now that's a huge loss in productivity. And these girls are missing out on education due to not having access to sanitary products, not having access to information on menstruation. That is not acceptable. In 2021, you can't have girls for going school because of menstruation. That's a huge impact on a girl's education. Totally, yes. Um, to continue on the same topic, um, so it's a fact that period poverty and its impact has been worsened by the COVID-19 uh, context and other natural and man-made disasters, which Sri Lanka has experienced in the past uh, few years. So um, in this context, uh, what makes this conversation, uh, I mean, that is what makes this conversation deeply relevant to our times. Um, so my next question is again um, for both the speakers. Um, has the current COVID-19 context uh, and the company, the recent natural and man-made disasters had an impact on uh, women's access to sanitary products and broader sexual and reproductive health care? Um, let's start with uh, Dr. Rashmira. Sure. So, um, yes, definitely the pandemic has halted a lot of progress we made in the field of sexual and reproductive health and in combating period poverty. I think speaking on behalf of the ARC initiative as well, we deal with a lot of, uh, we're, we're making a lot of solutions to try and tackle period poverty. And we have, uh, we have been met with a lot of challenges just because of the pandemic and the lockdowns and the floodings. Um, but something that is really important that was, uh, I saw a couple of weeks ago, a very poignant picture of a lady who was wading through water, and I think Anuki saw, shared it as well. She was wading through water that was almost neck deep, almost neck deep in water, holding a packet of sanitary pads, trying to get a packet of sanitary pads across to her daughter. And that just goes to show how essential this uh, product is. And it can't be a luxury like that. It's, a, it's something that every human, every bleeding woman needs. And additionally, during the lockdowns, I, living in an urban setting, found it hard to get access to sanitary napkins. And the lockdown was at least for four weeks. So almost every uh, woman who has a menstrual cycle was had at least one menstrual cycle during lockdown. So I can't imagine how difficult it was for a woman in a rural community to get access to sanitary napkins during um, the pandemic. Um, additionally, speaking uh, about the sexual reproductive health care access, um, obviously, clinics have been conducting all the sexual and reproductive health clinics at a very minimum occupancy level, so we don't overcrowd clinics, and we, um, you know, go go along with the safety guidelines, the COVID safety guidelines. So this has definitely had a huge impact on women accessing sexual and reproductive health, 
even getting um, the next contraceptive dose, getting the next dose of the depo injection, it's, it's all that, getting antenatal or postnatal care, um, getting screened for sexually transmitted infections and the amount of unplanned pregnancies that might have happened. Um, so definitely the pandemic has had huge consequences on sexual and reproductive health in Sri Lanka. Thank you. Um, yes, Anuki. I think I would just follow what Rashmira said because, I mean, think about it, right? A packet of pads retail at... Uh, 175 for a packet of 10 between 175 to 350 daily wage workers have not had work consistent work for over a year now right migrant workers are back they don't have a way to feed their families they don't have a way to go back a, a packet of pads is more expensive than a salmon tin and in a family of four let's say mom dad son daughter you know, would they rather choose something that feeds four people or or tends to the needs of two? I I think that that just it, it is a explanation in itself. It's just exacerbated these issues, and and we really we can't keep waiting for the next disaster to realize that we need to do something because it's only it's only going to keep getting worse. True. Thank you. Um, now we are coming to the final part of the discussion. Um, I would like to remind everyone, um, if you have any questions, please uh, direct those to us. We'll be happy to take them. Um, so as the final question um, to you, uh, Dr. Rashmira and Anuki, um, I would like to know um, your opinions on uh, what would be the best way forward in engaging uh, with and also against the norms of menstruation the results and the result in sexist and almost uh, punitive policies. Um, so, uh, Dr. Rashmira, if you can respond to this um, from the healthcare angle and also from the community side, what would be uh, the best way to um, uh, engage against these norms? Yeah, I think uh, from a healthcare aspect, when you're talking about bodily autonomy, I think there are definitely changes that are taking place even uh, changes to kind of come back to current laws that we have. So for instance, when we're talking about abortion, um, yes, abortion is completely illegal in Sri Lanka, but the Ministry of Health has a post-abortion care guideline. So that basically means that if any woman has had an abortion, an unsafe abortion outside, but she needs medical care, she can come to any government hospital and get medical care without the fear of prosecution. So that is a huge improvement, I think, in trying to prevent people, trying to prevent women from dying from uh, unsafe abortions, which is a huge concern in this country with more than 650 unsafe abortions taking place every single day. Uh, with regards to period poverty, I think there's now a lot more discussion about uh, the topic and much more awareness around it just because of the youth about with social media engagement. I think there's been a lot more talk about it and that's, that's great to have. Um, Additionally, I think corporates also have now realized that there are problems with period inequalities within their companies as well as the communities they serve. So they are also more aware that something needs to be done. And uh, speaking on behalf of the ARC initiative, I mean, we are a group of young professionals, not just doctors, but lawyers, teachers, psychologists, um, different professions coming together for a common cause to help uh, raise awareness on sexual and reproductive health topics and tackle period poverty. And through the ARC initiative, we continue to do um, sessions to schools virtually now on sexual and reproductive health information. We are currently working uh, on getting our own sanitary pad down. Obviously, the COVID pandemic has kind of had, we've had problems trying to get it from India to Sri Lanka, but soon we'll be up and running in Matugama in a couple of weeks that we can distribute very low cost sanitary pads to not just Matugama, but the entire country, essentially. We've also worked with HEMAS. Um, they have produced a low cost sanitary pad and we conduct menstrual health sessions for them together with Dilma and Sarvo there to kind of spread the message. We also work with Celine Handlooms who have created a reusable sanitary napkin. I think uh, Anuki had some, was given some samples. I got some samples as well and they're great. They're a great um, sustainable way of dealing with menstruation and we conduct uh, sexual reproductive health sessions for them as well. So I think it's changing. It's definitely changing, but there's a lot more work that needs to be done. And uh, as a community, I think we need to pressurize the policymakers now to make changes, very necessary changes um, to the taxes that are going, that's currently there for uh, sanitary products. Thank you, doctor. 
like you rightly said, yes, it is very vital to um, influence the policymakers on these reforms. So Anuki, you are an expert on that. Uh, so what would you say the best way to uh, do this kind of um, influences? I think it's really time we start asking questions because for the past two to three years, there's been lots of awareness. Everyone, you know, there's been lots of grassroots organizations and there's been lots of work that's been done. And from the side of policymakers and the government too, we've heard, um, you know, certain commitments. For example, there was a commitment to, um, you know, start giving girls and the girls, um, girls over grade six. Uh, in, in government schools to give them pre sanitary napkins. Now, there hasn't been school for over a year, right? Was this even gazetted? Where is the gazette? You know, has there been an allocation? If, if the allocation is there, then why can't we use the funds differently? I think it's time now for us to really start asking those questions. And I mean, I just saw another question on the chat that said, what can we, the public, do? And I think that is really having open conversations. Um, you know, for the longest time, I sometimes thought, you know, speaking to the same group of people means like you're speaking to a choir. So, you know, it's the same, you're echoing the same conversations. But the more I have those conversations, the more I'm realizing that we have so much stigma entrenched in us and so much misinformation entrenched that there's a lot of unlearning that even as individuals we've got to do. So really having open conversations with your families, with your friends, with your co-workers, um, you, with your teachers will hopefully, hopefully that might bring about some sense of behavior change uh, in, in the coming years. But I think that is that is something key for all of us to, to have open conversations and there's so much work being done. I mean, for example, the work that ARCA is doing is incredible. Support organizations like that. Sally now has the reusable pad. Try it, use it, encourage your friends to do so as well because that's a more sustainable, eco-friendly option. So there are these, there are, there are grassroots organizations really trying to make a difference in people's lives. So do some research and, and, and support them. Thank you. Um, we also have uh, received several questions in our chat. Um, so one question is for you, Dr. Rashmira. Um, when you speak to women communities about their issues in terms of practicalities, how do you connect with people, especially men and community leaders or religious leaders on issues which could be sensitive because they are also uh, culturally ingrained? Yeah, that's a very good question. And that's actually a challenge that we face when we go out into communities, into rural communities. But um, I've always been surprised by the uh, how, pe how much people want to learn, how much information they lack and how much knowledge they want to gain. And I do think that if you speak to them on a, you know, on an on a proper, like, you know, a one-to-one -one conversation, a simple conversation, and you bring men to the table to understand what women are going through, because it's not their fault. No one told them what the menstrual cycle was. They don't understand that every month this happens and you get pain, you have heavy bleeding, there's a lot of blood, it can be messy. They don't understand that. So you need to bring men to the conversation and bring men to the table and have an honest, open discussion. So now even with ARCA, we have what we call the ARCA circles. And we encourage as many men to join as possible. So they also understand because they also have sexual and reproductive health rights. It's just that women's sexual and reproductive health rights are the ones that are that's pushed back all the time. And so it's important to make them understand as well what period poverty is, what menstruation is, and what they can do to make a change. And it's the same with religious leaders because uh, more, majority of religious leaders are men and you have to bring them to the table or you're not going to get any change in terms of policy because you get more objections uh, than agreements when it comes to policy changes. So we definitely have to bring them to the table and approach it in a very honest and simple manner where they also need to understand what the menstrual cycle is, what menstruation is. Thank you. Um, we also have a question uh, to Anuki. Um, so you have talked about how advocate advocacy, among others, um, has accomplished a lot in terms of bringing the tax down. Uh, thinking of a new organization which might be working on this, what does strong advocacy look like and how do we go about it? Um, 
to us and to me, this sort of campaign and advocacy has really been a learning process. But to look back, I think, uh, and, and, I, and I say it's a top, bottom, bottom up sort of approach where simultaneously, you, while you educate policymakers and those making the decisions of the intricacies of the topic, the impact to, to women, the impact to girls, you also do a public, very front facing advocacy, encouraging people to have conversations, encouraging them to make this their issue too. Um, and I think that sort of, so you need to build public pressure in, in any good sort of advocacy campaign. You need to build public pressure while, you know, you also make sure you have champions from within government, you have champions from within policymakers to take it to the tables it needs to be taken to. And I think um, what happened was a lovely harmony of that suddenly. Uh, and, and these things, that's how it happens, right? There's sometimes um, an issue that, get, that gets exacerbated, then there's suddenly conversation around it, and then that is kind of your window of opportunity to, 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 to take the opportunity, to take it and run. So I think that, that, that's uh, my advice in terms of advocacy campaigns. Thank you. Um, there's another question on abortions. Um, uh, there's a restrictive pattern on uh, abortion since it is reasoned out and it could be a uh, misused. What do you think about it? Where can we draw the line on abortions to avoid its misuse for mischievous intentions? Dr. Rashmira? Yeah, so uh, my opinion on abortions, you have to realize that I have seen the consequence of not having um, a safe abortion. Uh, I have seen women septic, I have seen women die, I have seen 14 year olds, I have seen, uh, two 14 year olds give birth, I've seen a 13 year old give birth. I have been at the receiving end of this. And then you're thinking about the consequences of this child. I have seen a lot of, uh, or a lot of the consequences, the bad consequences of not have, being, having access to a safe abortion. And that's why I think if we want to, uh, you know, reform abortion law, it's important because of these consequences, at least in the case of incest, rape, and lethal congenital anomalies. Um, and this can be decided for by two doctors and a legal representative to make sure that there is no, um, you know, no distrust when you conduct a safe abortion, but it has to be done because um, when you see women, uh, young girls having to go through a pregnancy that they got pregnant because of rape, it's awful. It is uh, psychologically damaging to that individual. And then again, to that child that has to be born as a result of rape or incest. Um, so I think there definitely needs to be a, a reform when it comes to abortion. And I think we've gone back and forth and back and forth between parliament and back with a possible reform, but nothing has come out of it because of religious objections. Um, but the majority of the medical community is for reform because we are the ones who see the consequence of not having safe abortions. Um, we have another question. Um, so both uh, Dr. Ashpira and Anuki uh, spoke about sustainable sanitary products. Um, so um, the, it's great to see a lot of sustainable sanitary products being developed, but then again, uh, there are above the, they are above the price range for average women. Are there any policy efforts to make these products more accessible to women, uh, possibly through women-centered grassroots approaches? like in the case of India? Um, to tackle sort of in, in, in terms of making it accessible, yes, there are some grassroots approaches. I do know that now ACA, they're trying to bring a machine down. They're trying to make low cost sanitary napkins. I do know that there was the Women's um, women's Entrepreneurs Council or the South Women Chamber of Commerce, either of the one. They brought a machine down a couple of years ago as well. But these happen in very small production numbers, right? Um, and, and this is, we're talking about a country of 52% women, a country of like 5.7 million menstruating women so right now there are grassroots efforts but it it is not enough definitely to cater to the demand that's coming in and that is why um, even at Advocata we we picked the route of getting the import tariff down because there's a big question that people ask all the time they say you know there's local producers here um, why are you trying to get the import tax down there are local producers here but there's what two three brands available in the market 
Uh, and that's it. And then there's just the three, four product rate, but two product ranges really wings, no, no wings, and then heavy and light flow. And then that's all the option there is. But if, if there are open markets, if there is competition, there are products that, that are brought down. I mean, in a survey that we did, I realized that because I was looking at brands of sanitary napkins that people use in Sri Lanka, and I realized that in um, Candy, there were some really odd brands that came up that were not, you know, that did not come up anywhere else in the country. And I and I looked into it and I realized that these were imports from India. And it was a sanitary napkin packet was being sold at, I think, 90 or 100, which is about 30 to 40 rupees less than what the local, what the base price is in the local market. So, you know, that is one way, hopefully, to get more products in, to have more competition and to give more give uh, more choice to women. Because there are grassroots organizations, but it doesn't cater to the demand. And, and how, how many years do we have to wait, uh, you know, to keep building up uh, only local production to be able to cater, you know, to menstruating women? Thank you. Uh, uh, we have, yes, uh, Dr. Rashmira. So I just have one thing to add, and as Anik, Anuki rightly said, there is there needs to be more competition because when you increase the prices of the imported sanitary napkins, the local manufacturers can have whatever price they want. You know what I mean? I mean they increase it unnecessarily. So if you have if you reduce the taxes on the imported sanitary napkins, then the local market has to make a more competitive price as well, and they have to reduce their pricing. So that I completely agree with Anuki that there has to be more competition in the market. Um, there are two um, questions related to period poverty. Um, one is related with uh, mental health. Um, so how significantly does period poverty affect one's mental health? Shall I take this? Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Um, yeah, so actually uh, you have to think about the stigma. If you have period poverty, that means you don't have access uh, to a sanitary product, basically, which means you can't, you most likely, you have to stay home during those, the days you bleed, because a lot of people, when they don't have um, sanitary products, they, and sometimes they use cloth, they might leak, they're embarrassed to go out. So they'd rather stay home uh, than go out. So that limits their activity and it definitely puts a damp on a person's mental health because you're limiting yourself purely because of uh, something you can't control, which is your menstrual cycle. And uh, you can't go out, you can't function as normal, you might have to miss events, you might have to miss school, miss work. Um, it definitely affects your mental health if when there's period poverty due to all these reasons. Thank you. Um, the other question on period poverty, I would like to direct to Anuki. Um, to someone who doesn't know about period poverty, how can we answer the question, why should we care about period poverty? and make our answer as informed as possible? Well, that is a tough one uh, because when people, you know, just, just the lack of, just the ignorance and lack of awareness itself is going to be, it's going to be a tough conversation to have, right? But I think it's important to talk about the prices of the product and your experience. I mean, if you're a woman having this conversation, um, when I talk to my friends, when I talk to especially sometimes male colleagues, um, you know, male peers, for example, I would always talk about how when I first started, like, you know, when I first started buying, you know, my own century pads, I always used to wonder, you know, why it was so expensive. And this, and this happened the first time I went to buy a tampon too. And just having that open conversation and relating that experience kind of puts makes them also realize that okay this is a lived issue around it, two women around them as well because I think that is the that is the biggest issue here that disconnect um, you know, because a lot of people think, oh, yeah, period poverty is just an issue in rural communities. Um, you know, it's, it's very disconnected to our circles and our families. And that's not the case. It, it, it exists everywhere and everybody has some story to tell. So I think that might be the best approach to take when you're talking to when you're making someone realize that period poverty is an actual issue and something they should be concerned about. Thank you. Um, we just got another question. Um, we have heard the example of India. Um, there are other similar initiatives uh, we are seeing across the world that we can learn from. 
and be encouraged by. So I think this is um, with reference to uh, sustainable um, sanitary products. Um, any comments that you want to give on that? Um, so for in, in our case with the ARC initiative, our pad machine is actually coming from India and it's similar to the pad machine that, you know, the movie Padman, uh, where he built this machine to manufacture low, you know, low cost pads for his wife and his community. It's a similar machine, it's a similar mechanism. Uh, and we use raw material that comes from India. Of course, eventually, I think once it comes and once we get with it going, we can definitely speak to engineers here and get a get a similar one manufactured where we use raw materials that are available in the country as opposed to, as a, uh, opposed to having to import the raw materials from India. Um, so these are all things that we can do, but of course um, the COVID pandemic has kind of put a halt in a lot of our progress. But I think once a pad machine comes here for on behalf of the ARC initiative, we'll definitely get up and running and then we'll be able to kind of move it out into other areas as well um, because it's such a it's such a great option. At the moment, it's not biodegradable sanitary pads. So that's another option that we'll definitely be looking into. Again, it depends on your raw materials use and uh, dealing with the NMR as well to make sure they're happy on that side uh, of things. But yeah, so there are definitely a lot of things that we can um, kind of uh, take on board when we're considering what India has done to tackle period poverty. Um, but yeah, it's looking positive. I think we are taking a lot of what India has done that has helped them and we are taking that on board and doing it here as well. Thank you. Um, so during our discussion, we um, discussed um, a lot on um, uh, the accessibility to education on uh, sexual and reproductive health. So there is a, a question related to that. Uh, what is the role of parents in ministration, ministerial health education? Um, Dr. Rashmira, if you want to take it. Um, so uh, parents are very, it's an important aspect of giving menstrual health education. I think uh, the UNFP also had a discussion a, a year or so ago on whether it's the role of the teachers or whether it's the role of the parents to um, kind of give that child sexual and reproductive health education was a debate. And it was a uh, very interesting points uh, from both sides, but definitely I think both parties are responsible for giving a child men's uh, sexual and reproductive health education. Uh, because you never know at what point of time the child is going to need it. So it's really important that parents, I think, especially explain menstruation at an early age, because if the child, you know, attains uh, her first, has a first period at an early age, she, you might miss that both. So I think when they'll turn around 10 or 11, it's important in basic terms just to explain what a menstrual cycle is, uh, what happens and you're not dying. Because I remember when I had my first period, I didn't know what was happening and I thought I was dying. So... Uh, it's really important to explain to children that they're not alarmed by this, that this is just a normal biological process that happens when you're growing up and when you're turning into a woman. Uh, so I think it's really important for the parent to take on uh, responsibility uh, of ensuring that child has uh, menstrual health education and not just uh, depend on the school system, especially as there is a lack of sexual uh, reproductive health education in Sri Lanka. Um, that was indeed a great conversation. Thank you very much, Anuki and Dr. Rashmira, um, for joining with us today and sharing your expertise on these issues. And also uh, for those who tuned in, um, this conversation is meant to uh, spark further conversations among families and communities. So we urge those who have tuned in to continue to discuss this. Uh, so that as a country, we become more invested in fighting against stigmas on menstruation and body the autonomy of women, and also easing the burden of accessing sanitary products. Thank you, and um, have a good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you.